good evening and welcome to the black hole uh, what lessons can pakistan learn from bosnia and herzegovina uh, this is our today's topic several parallels can be drawn between pakistan and uh, bosnia and herzegovina two points for example one uh, the track initially taken by the balkan muslims uh, was inspired by the pakistani model iske kya consequences the ye i hope ki aaj ki guftugu mein cover ho jayenge point number two uh, bosnia's journey from poverty to stability offers valuable lessons for pakistan to overcome its sufferings uh, we are very grateful and we are very honored to have professor dr shahab yar khan uh, he is a leading expert in english renaissance <laughs> he is a leading expert in english renaissance and shakespearean studies at the university of sarajevo Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, a brief uh, bio uh, since 1997 he has devoted over two decades uh, to promoting shakespearean drama and english literature in the region also he is the founder of uh, the shakespeare drama club at uh, the university of sarajevo author of eight critical books and numerous research papers or i think kuch unme se prize winning bhi hai in the bosnia Oh, best sellers actually uh, his pioneering theories on the nature of renaissance including genesance and primusance have gained international recognition uh, dr shahab yar khan has toured europe south asia and north america uh, contributing significantly to the study of teaching and pedagogy uh, in response to the covid pandemic his views on teaching have gained prominence currently involved in various academic and theatrical projects including his upcoming novella job of an interpreter based on uh, true accounts related to the refugee crisis in europe so of course we are very honored to have him here isse pehle ki hum ye session shuru kare please do one thing and this is that aap apne jo cell phones hai usko silent mode mein kar de taaki kisi tarah ki distraction na ho when the house is open for q and a uh, and you want to um, share your views just raise your hand or microphone apne haath mein aane ke baad aap apni baat kijiyega ladies and gentlemen let's welcome dr shahab yar khan thank you very grateful for all this uh, amazing place which i have been watching online for years and years i have watched almost all black hole programs and what a pleasure it was to see parvez hood boy as well and had a photograph with him he was my childhood hero as well this kind of awareness that we have today in our civilization that what is actually culture what is knowledge what is wisdom what is chaos and what is anarchy if you look around yourself it's possible that we have lost the touch of that line with the mark the two various kinds of modes of life i've been you know driving around lahore especially islamabad as well and it seems that uh, okay it was never something very disciplined traffic i mean 30 years ago 25 years ago as well but now what we have chaos is not a word for that it seems that gradually a collapse which was going on for almost two three decades has now reached its very bottom what's next that's alarming and for that kind of talk this kind of a uh, stage in a very uh, confused kind of civilization where we don't know what we say can become all of a sudden a crime could become all of a sudden something which can uh, inflame people's uh, feelings you know hurt their minds it's a blessing of god trust me i have seen professor ishtaq ahmed here talking three programs in a row i have seen some of the other great academics coming here you know and talking about various things chandrayaan which was uh, not very much welcome by the those state welcomed it actually but it seemed that uh, when it comes to common understanding on media many people claim that perhaps it never landed here on this platform parvez hood bhai had a program he talked about it in what way this trajectory which was so precisely managed so uh, we can learn something from chandrayaan i was celebrating 
in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Ahmed was celebrating, Amina was celebrating with my kids, you know. And we realized the way Parvid Hubai has organized this thing is kind of a blessing for us, all of us, whether you live in Pakistan or you live abroad. That's why I thought when I'm here in Pakistan, I had some, you know, at least eight or nine various kinds of lectures at various universities in Lahore. I was surprised to see the standard. It was amazing. But then Parvez Hudbhai decided I could come here as well and talk very briefly about my understanding of civilization as I see in Bosnia and Herzegovina and the way I have observed Pakistan because after all subcontinent is in my blood, in my soul. As I say, uh, you can leave anything if you are subcontinental, but you cannot leave your subcontinentalism. Uh, that will be there always, even when you are deep down underground. Bosnia Herzegovina, I decided to have this kind of a introduction for our audience here. As you can see, uh, you know perhaps the 1990s war had destroyed the country completely. You can see this is our town hall, which was the biggest library of Sarajevo and of course among the three largest ones in Yugoslavia. Uh, this was the monumental destruction. I mean, they say around three to four million documents, archives, were burned here in this library. That was complete destruction of a civilization. These uh, monumental documents dated back to four centuries, five centuries. When this was burned, history was gone. And then happened this, the massacres, concentration camps, women, children, atrocities of the kind, they say, Europe had not seen since the Second World War. The world was celebrating at that point. This is NATO officers sharing their drinks with the aggressors, the Yugoslav army generals. And here I've quoted uh, perhaps the most famous lines by a great Bosnian poet, Mark Dizdar. I wish his poems could be translated in Urdu perhaps, in Punjabi as well, in other languages, because he's the most relevant poet to us. These lines are amazing. I cannot translate all, but just for the taste. This earth is a seed which bears death within. But then death is not an end. A cycle happens, and that makes us to see a path which from destruction leads us to the galaxies. It's an amazing, amazing idea how your own destruction, your, our own death, can actually be the cause of uh, setting us free from the chaos that we have lived in. Mark Dizda died in 1971, but most of his poetry was relevant in the 1990s. He became the most popular poet. Then came the second phase. The war stopped. Americans interfered, reconstruction began, the town hall was restored, this is the same library. Many of the documents were now recovered from Belgrade, from Russia, where we had some of the copies as well. Not all, but 20% were recovered. Many of those criminals, as you can see, the one who is having the drink here, arrested. They were wanted, first of all, then one by one arrested and sent to Hague, where they were trialed and were punished. The third phase of growth, you have seen catastrophe, you have seen recovery, now the growth. So Bosnia and Herzegovina opening towards trade, towards tourism, towards all sorts of possibilities that could help people to breathe a bit. And then comes the most important phase of Bosnian history, where the hero from the country which attacked Bosnia and Herzegovina, that is called Serbia, became a Bosnian hero as well. At some point, you have to bury the hatchet. You cannot keep on grinding your ax. When the neighbor is sitting next, this kind of, you know, chest up, head up, slogans, challenges, and have a strange faith in something which doesn't exist, actually. This metaphysical, Dementia, you can say, which leads to nowhere. Somehow, they overcame it. This man is Djokovic. Djokovic, Novak Djokovic, is a great tennis player. 
Well, they say he's perhaps the greatest tennis player ever born in history. He visits now Bosnia and Herzegovina on a monthly basis. He has many clubs where he trains kids voluntarily. This phase of progress has many phases. I think the most significant one is this one, when banking sector became somehow stable and money started coming to Bosnia and Herzegovina. As you can see, I've written here, the point number two, the financial system is based on the existence of currency board. Uh, all of us understand what is currency board. For example, some countries can enter into an agreement where the value of their currency, in comparison with some superior currency, in our case, euro, for example, is considered stable. It will not change. It's not variable. So, uh, for example, we have one euro equal to two Bosnian marks. Now, this was a great incentive. As a result of this incentive, we had all sorts of money flooding into Bosnia and Herzegovina. All these banks that you see up are basically European banks. They have very deep roots now. People get good services. We have new kind of technology introduced in finances. And of course, as a result, our GDP has grown. This is eighth consecutive year of Bosnia and Herzegovina when we are in surplus. 31.92 is the percentage of the growth of GDP in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Foreign currency reserves have increased. As a result, our salaries, which were very, very, very meager in amount, are slightly better now. I mean, if you trust me, I have worked in my university, which is called University of Sarajevo, English department. I began with 250 mark, at that point, Deutsche mark. You understand, I mean, 250 mark. Today, it is in several thousands. It's a huge difference within a decade or so. Third aspect is also connected with the trade idea. Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, as you can see, I have added this picture here. It's one of the most iconic pictures from the war time. Women, 50,000 of them, taken to concentration camps. What happened with them? We all know about it. It's one of the most horrific, horrific chapters of human history, what happened with those 50,000 women in those camps. But within two decades, there's a Bosnian woman over there. One of the UN representatives for IT. We have produced at least two dozen of these girls in the last two decades, which is almost one girl a year. Which have, uh, with the power to represent Bosnia and Herzegovina in fields of culture, entertainment, and of course, information technology. What Bosnia has done in the meantime, which side would you go? You have, on one hand, Bosnian population, 55, 52%, now there's a 55% perhaps, Muslims. Then you have 35% or so Serbs, Orthodox Christians, and then you have, of course, 12 to 13% Catholic Christians. So which way to go? You have entire Islamic, how we say, ummah, with hands like this, you know, in 1995, welcoming you. On the other hand, you have Russia, the allies of Serbia. Then you have communists. If you're living in some more traditional country like Pakistan in 1970s, things are different now. Heathens, non-believers, and then, of course, Europeans who never came to help you during the war time. Which way to go? An amazing balanced policy was introduced. <coughs> On one hand, you can see the Indian head of the Chamber of Commerce. They initiated in 2016 a forum which actually had to launch the Indian companies of various kinds of, you know, production companies. It could be entertaining houses as well, film production as, as well, moving towards Bosnia and Herzegovina, using Bosnia as its platform, and by 2025, they had to have some results. Time is coming very soon. And then Chinese, of course. Chinese decided that uh, the best way to have some kind of investment in Bosnia and Herzeg, we call it Bosnia and Herzeg, Bosnia and Herzegovina, is to grab all the possible means of transport. Today, within this four or five years, 
everything that you think as transport, be it a, a trolley bus, be it a tram, be it a train. It's controlled by the Chinese. And the infrastructure they have introduced there is amazing. Within three to four years, city has changed, country is transformed. As a result of this interest of India and China, otherwise two rivals in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the state had to introduce means to have more security. Result, Bosnia, uh, the crime rate in Bosnia and Herzegovina is now reduced to minimum, 0.98, 24% decline from 2020. On the other hand, we are in Pakistan, increase of 6.48%. Investment cannot possibly come if law and order is not well maintained. As a result of this kind of uh, all sorts of you know, money just coming flooding into Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have new tourist resorts appearing where Arabs mainly are focused, but then people are coming from Scandinavia, from Western Europe. We have all sorts of new sources of energy. You can see uh, Hydra there and windmills over there. And the most important project is this one with the help of the Chinese. This road is connecting Bosnia Herzegovina to Germany. Entire Europe will be covered. And that will shorten the distances if it is, let's say, 20 hours today to 10 hours. Already, we have reached almost until Zagreb, which is the first European country after Bosnia and Herzegovina. Just last week, the president of EU, Ursula von der Leyen, she has given this statement. As you can see, Bosnia and Herzegovina's future is in European Union. And how much we want to have you as the full member the work you have done shows that the country can deliver. This, she said, just last week. This entire infrastructure, which we have seen emerging in the last 20 years or so, is 57% Bosnians, NGOs, private sector, and public sector investing in the industrial areas and, of course, other corporate areas. 40% is from EU. And as you can see, that most of our as a result of this, EU agencies working there, most of our money is generated through services. We have 65, 65%, something like that, of our entire economy, depending on services. As a result of that, this is our, you know, the biggest supermarket in Sarajevo. It's called Sarajevo City Center. And very often you will see this phrase appearing there. We believe in the future of Bosnia and Herzegovina. From the bridges of the ancient times reconstructed, from the churches and the mosques reconstructed, to the new technology and new resorts appearing, we have perhaps a better future ahead of us. But I'm not argue proof. This is Shakespeare's sentence. Perhaps Professor will uh, uh, enjoy it more, Shakespearean lover over here. Um, I'm not argue proof. It's a line by King Lear. When King Lear deserted, abandoned by everybody, left in a desert. Desert in England. I said, where is that desert in England? I've never seen that. Symbolically speaking, dislocation of self within. Standing nowhere. Absolutely. It's a place of nowhere. But that's places within ourselves. When we get lost there, we try to relocate ourselves. And then it's possible you figure it out that I'm none of these and I'm all of these. These are three major religions or traditions of Bosnia and Herzegovina. This is Ayatovic. Ayatovic is a mysterious place. Here Muslims go for a pilgrimage every year. The, the tradition says some great saint, some sheikh, some, some wali, passing by this place, people complained, we have no water resource. He took his, you know, the Hazrat Musa salam story. He took his wand and just hit the rock, split into two, and water gushed through. This is the tradition we have every year celebrating Ayatovich. Then in the middle you have amazing icons, a fresco which we have from our old church, what we call, it's a Serbian Orthodox church. This, if you trust me, is the oldest Orthodox iconology on planet Earth. It may date back 
to 1200s. I've been to Iran, and there I saw these Armenian churches, but to my surprise, none of these churches dated back before 1500s. We have a church in Sarajevo intact, in Muslim area, dating back to 1200s. Then, of course, the most celebrated place of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'm not sure if you have heard about it. This is called Medjugorje. Medjugorje, for your information, is the most visited place in Europe, more visited than Vatican. Here, some kids had a vision of Virgin Mary. And since then, it's a pilgrim point. Millions and millions visit it every year. At the moment, we live in harmony. Harmony in a way that we haven't yet broken the Dayton Accord. It's a very fragile piece, but it is there. But I'm not argue proof. I still have to locate myself more deeper, more deep, more and more deep within myself. This was all data which I wanted to share with you. Data you can download from internet. Data is not important, is it? But there are other dimensions of civilization. Three things I wanted to share. Now, beside this data, I'll wind it up now. One, what I've seen in Bosnia and Herzegovina and why I want my children to be there. Every single child must have education. Amina was late for a year because she had bronchitis. So we decided she must spend some time at the seaside. Police knocked at the door. Where is your kid? Why is she not at school? We had to explain. You may be a gypsy child. You may be a child of a president. Whoever you are, you have to attain your basic education. Books for free. School next doors. It's a system, since the community is small, so this, these things could really function. Every neighborhood has its own school. So children living in that particular mahalla, we also use the word mahalla in Bosnia and Herzegovina, children living in a mahalla of that particular mahalla must attend this particular school, which is across the road. School, I mean, I went to school here. I went to a public school, which was called Central Model School, something about Lahore. It was not 1940s, it was 1979. Three years, I was on drugs. 156 colleagues were with me. And I always tell my kids, sometimes, when the teacher would come, especially this uh, shorter guy, who was our Islami art teacher, and drawing teacher, and biology teacher, all three subjects he would do, I was the you know, back bencher always. For minutes and minutes, I would know. What he's talking, which subject is that actually? Until he would draw something, ah, he's drawing now. 156 kids. Some of them, of course, from a very poor background. My background was privileged in a way that I had you know, professors and doctors in my family. Some middle class, like myself, some, you know, some actually uh, traders, sons as well over there. But all of them, I swear by God, were very talented children. Some of them are my friends. We cannot locate more than six today. Two of us are abroad. Two of us are in Prime Minister's Secretariat. They keep on burning their offices every now and then. One of them had burned the office just last year. And to say, what happened? He said, very, very fortunate. Just jumped from the window and I say, yeah, of course, as if I don't know. Well done, well done, bravo. You have done a good job burning all the records, all the offices. But they're there. They're good friends. Not more than six can be traced. Where are these kids? This was one generation only. Generation after generation. Decades after decades. We have massacred these kids. When I compare with that small country, Bosnia and Herzegovina, not one kid would be sacrificed. They have to be in school. <sighs> Two, which I want to share with you. 
please give your children some health facility. It's a crime. Our hospitals are not like European hospitals there. But trust me, as compared to our hospitals in Islamabad and Karachi, I mean, local public hospitals, not private. They're heavens. They're clean. They're gems free. There are no cats roaming around in operation theaters. I have seen with my own eyes. My cousin was having his operation. He had an accident. In um, uh, uh, Mayo Hospital, uh, Hospital Lahore, that was in the 1970s, a cat was there in operation theater. We keep on watching these videos every now and then. These kids have their entire treatment, which is actually compulsory for them. Teeth, eyes, and other things for free. I have my checkup for free, which I try to escape sometimes because I don't like the needle. And my wife forces me to go there and do all the nasty things, you know. But it's for free. So please provide education to your children. Have some means. Whenever you vote for someone, it doesn't matter who is the party, who is the gentleman, who is the lady. But give us some school. Give my kids some health. And third thing. have some shelter for our heads. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, there is no such thing as homelessness. Of course, there was hundreds and thousands of them homeless just 30 years ago, 25 years ago, 20 years ago. Gradually, society has decided to rehab. Not a single person lives shelterless. So what we can learn from Bosnia and Herzegovina? Whatever resources you have, channelize them well. Your trades will not function if you don't have educated generations coming just to support your trade. If your kids are, as Imran Khan used to say, not reaching half of their level of nourishment, you have a nation which will never rise to any level of any caliber. And if you don't have shelter over the heads, they will just be criminals and nothing else. So when you have 60% children in this country not going to school, you have 60% criminals on the move in the next 10 years. Many of them will be suicide bombers as well. Because no law and order, no discipline as I see the cars on the roads is possible anymore. It's up to community consciousness. Politicians have failed you. Systems have failed us. Nothing wrong with the system. system. All systems are good systems. What can be wrong with the system? But we have failed it. And I request that when it comes to understanding of your civilization, first thing that we need to do, like Bosnians did, stop boosting off. There's nothing to boost off. I come from a very, very, very proud family. Perhaps not more than two, three percent people would like to have a challenge with me, you know, when it comes to boosting off. Eight centuries tradition I have in higher education teaching. Eight centuries. I can trace my ancestors from students of Ibn Arabi to Dr. Ibadat Barelvi all the way down, from Damascus to Baghdad to Lahore. Delhi, Lahore, Lakhnang, Bareilly. Ahmed Adha Khan Bareilly was among our ancestors. General Bakht Khan, the last warrior, is among my ancestors. I have shaheeds in my family, fought against the Brits. We are scholars, we are warriors. We are committed to the roots of subcontinent. But I cannot boost off. I don't see means, I don't see grounds upon which I can, I can stand and have my chest like that because 60% kids are without shelter, without means to have enough food in their bellies tonight. How surprising it is that Pakistan, India as well actually, we are among the top producers, dairy products, meat, water resources, 
and 60% of our kids have nothing to eat. So something is wrong somewhere else. God and nature have very little to do with these things, and miracles don't happen. I just tell my kid, yeah, miracle could happen in a cricket game, but in civilization, it doesn't happen. It's so clear which way we are moving. Only possibility from this me some very humble example, Bosnia and Herzegovina, very poor country. But no kid is hungry, no kid is shelterless, and every single kid has education. If you can do these three things, it's possible that by the next five, six, seven, eight, ten years, you can also claim that I'm now launching a new tourist resort. My banking sector is strong. My currency is also one to two to dollar. If you don't do that, I swear by Almighty Allah, miracle will not happen. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Thank you very much. Very thought provoking. Um, when it comes to state building, especially after the war years, how come Bosnia Herzegovina was able to come out of the war, were able to kind of you know make peace with itself and its neighbors very quickly, and then it started delivering basic human development also, and then even trade. And I'm saying this because. Well, I mean, I'm, you are a scholar of South Asia as well in many ways, and you understand that in our case, our politics really struggle to create consensus and move a policy. And since 1990s, uh, you could see that even on the fundamental quest questions of you know how to run politics or how to run a state, we really struggled even between key political parties. So I mean, overcoming these special interests and then creating consensus in a very diverse country, how did that happen? Yeah, it's a very good question. Thank you very much for this. I, it's very clear, actually, and many uh, political scientists have talked about it, that how it happened so quickly, that we are on some, we have some direction, actually. Until 1999, 2000, when I reached there, I think the, the crisis was still going on. The war fever was there. There were bridges in most our city, for example, and I was working on, on the Muslim side, where we had just established a Muslim so-called university, which I wanted to make diverse, which I did, alhamdulillah. On the other side, where Catholics had taken over the city, university was uh, not permitting any kids to enter. So they wanted to have mass migration of Muslims. And many colleagues suggested, please don't cross, because the way you look like an Arab or somebody, you know, uh, we don't guarantee anything. Mm -hmm. This was until 2000. 2010, until you know, I was in that university called Jamal Biedrich University, Mostar. Traffic was fluent. Trade was going on from this Mojigore, which is a Catholic place. I mean, caravans and thousands and thousands would come to the Muslim area, which is also a you know, historical area. They would buy souvenirs there. Muslims were going now to Majigore as well for trade purposes. I know personally many Muslims who have their souvenir shops in Majigore. So it seems that in, um, in that part of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, western uh, uh, part of Bosnia and Herzegovina, trade took over at some point. And all parties realized that ideology perhaps is good, but not very helpful for prosperity. If you go to Mostar today and Majigore, you won't believe it, what kind of houses you will see there. It's one of the most affluent area of entire Europe. Similar thing happened five, six years later, that is 2015 or so, uh, in the other side, which is actually Srpska Republika, which is Serbian dominating area, and the Muslim dominating area. Finally, these people who had those slogans, you know, were defeated. They lost elections because the new generation which had some knowledge, some information, gadgets in their hands, some primary education, could challenge. Education helped them to question what kind of Islam you want us to have. We are Muslims, 
But we are hungry Muslims. We are isolated Muslims. Help us to merge with Europe. And as a result, I think borders were opened. You won't believe me again. When Arabs decided to enter because the borders were open for Arabs, no visas. Accommodation sometimes 80% discounts. They just want you to have somebody to come. And they flooded in. When it came to this idea, okay, we can have some Arabic mahallas, neighborhoods, quarters. Way to locate the land. And Arabs decided they will have the high mountains at the top of Igman Mountain. Igman Mountain falls within the jurisdiction of Serbia, Serbs, Serbska Republika, Serbian government. And the deal was broken between the Muslims and Serbs, and land was allotted. Amazing infrastructure is there now. If you want to go to Serbia today, as a result of these, what you, we used to say at some point, confidence building measures. You remember this term? In 1990s, we had with India, CBMs. Because of these CBMs, today, Put your stuff, whatever it is, in your car, cross Serbia, no tax, sell it over there, come back to Bosnia Herzegovina, and vice versa. Montenegro is open to you, Serbia is open to you today. That's why Djokovic comes there. So I personally think trade is the key. I'm Sir Gilani, Director for Idea Save the World. And Save the World is from poverty and uh, wars, particularly the present, uh, you can say, world is facing at the drastic level. Uh, I would like to invite, uh, one thing, I would like to appreciate the way you showed your concern, particularly on humanity. Humanity, uh, you can say, goes everywhere and invites the attention of the hegemonic uh, rulers, though they are to rescue them from uh, homelessness and suffering. Uh, cases like Kashmir, uh, the Palestinian, and the Bosnians faced uh, one of the worst uh, uh, target killing and genocidal. Uh, the question is, what are the designs behind on target killing? Either through target killing and genocide, we are to make the ethnical uh, factions and sections of the society more rigid on it, more stick on it, or to get them relaxed and revisit and make their, uh, you can say, nation as a whole to rise over the uh, globe. Mean after destruction, when they are to revisit and recover and to go for the prosperity, they should, uh, uh, you can say, go for foreign investment or they should trust on their ideological foundations. Thanks. As, as a common sense, as a general sense, I would like to ask, okay, after destruction, they should go for the foreign relations to make and lift up the, uh, you can say, downtrodden society, or once again, they are to revisit their ideological foundations. I come from a very traditional family, you can understand that, you know, we have huge, huge history behind us. And what I have, whatever I have learned from my ancestors, what I have read in my library, you know, what I've seen from Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I've come to this realization that ideologies don't exist. Humanity does. So whenever somebody has done, committed a crime somewhere, be it Kashmir, be it uh, Palestinians entering Israel or Israelis bombing over here, you can't put actually parallels because sometimes uh, reactions are extreme, you know, disproportionate. We can't draw parallels, but whatever is a mishap, is a mishap. And when we, as a philosopher, as a thinker, as, a, as an educated person, when you reevaluate the situation, I think ideology should not be within it. It should be dynamics of, first of all, life. I mean, you know, when, when Bosnian war began, I, and Ahmed is 10 years of age, and I think he understands more than many politicians in Bosnia, so, you know, these dynamics because he, he reads a lot, he questions a lot. And our first question was, just a few years back, when the war started, 
you have no weapon, okay? There's an embargo on you. You're a Muslim community. What options you have? Fight with sticks, rocks, just jump in front of the tanks. They have tanks, JNA, that is Yugoslav <coughs> National Army, was the fourth largest army of Europe. It was a heavy military machine. You have no weapon. And how a leadership could take this position that we will fight? I don't see it in alignment with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who decided no fight for 10 years. If I'm wrong, please correct me. Unless you have your horses ready, how can you think of a war? You have to enter an agreement. And this is our, one of the biggest problems, you know, people like myself and this new generation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, why we had to go through four and a half years of total destruction. When I, when I saw Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1998, nothing was intact. Not a single building. Nothing. Human, how we say, ego, smashed. Your sense of honor, gone. Every second, third household had a woman kidnapped. So how to survive? How to survive? There's no, there's no outline to survive provided by the politicians who led them to a war. Now you can say maybe they were trapped themselves. It could be. We, if we were in that situation, I don't know how we'd have, we would have reacted. But whatever, whatever was done in 1991 was not the most wise, logical thing to do. First thing, I always say, I conclude this one. I always say, this is my understanding of a country. Country is not your boundary. It's my question, it's my challenge. You can disagree, of course. My position, a country is not a boundary. A country is every single individual. Why don't they teach us this thing? Instead of teaching us, I'll protect every inch of this country. Tell us once, for God's sake. I'll protect every individual of this country. Every child will be protected. They never say that. Zelensky is going for protecting every inch. 10 million people are uprooted. Every inch. Who the hell am I then? I am Pakistan. I am Bosnia Herzeg. Who, what is the land without me? Why don't they tell us this thing? They went for a five years war, leaving us absolutely broke. Hello, sir. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, myself, Mohammed Fahim Khan. Sir, I'm a student of BS English Literature. I want to answer one question. You draw a line between Pakistan's condition and the Bosnia Herzegovina conditions. Sir, there is one thing, and it's there, uh, there we can see a will or a wish in the people of Bosnia that they want to progress. But we can't see these things in, uh, in the case of Pakistan. Like here, we don't have such politicians that they can uh, create or build such policies through which our child can be protected. And on the second side, the parents has, uh, do not have the ability to educate their children. So how can we educate our children if the politician is not willing and the parent has no ability? I have a story, a small short story, okay? This, uh, in, in, it was again, 2000 perhaps, my early days in Mostar. There was a city called Stolets. It's a very historical, old, ancient city near Mostar. Mostar, you probably know, the way, where the bridge collapsed. So what happened, uh, a student of mine asked me, could I just, you know, join him for, for uh, you know, this uh, trip to Stolas, just 30, 30, meters, uh, 30 kilometers from, from, the, from the city. So we, we, we reached there. This city had a mosque in it. One of the most ancient mosques of the Balkans. Six centuries old mosque. Bulldozed, erased by the enemy. Now, when the Dayton Accord settled, Muslims were you know, sent back to their homes, at least partially. They asked the state and UN to have their mosque back, where they were constructing a church. And the states finally agreed, OK, you will get your land, but the money is coming from Saudi Arabia. There's the map. That's the model. You have to, you know, the way they want, the Saudis. This is how 
this has to be this way. This boy and thousand others, they stood against the map because that was not the map of that mosque. They said, this is not our mosque. The government said, if you don't build this mosque the way, we can't help you because there's no money. And there's the answer to your question. An entire community stood up, brick by brick. When the Turks heard about this movement, they, they located the maps in Istanbul and sent the maps of this mosque because everything was actually done within the Ottoman Empire. Brick by brick, a great English humanist, Martin Lynx, whose Muslim na name is Abu Bakr Sirajuddin. When Martin Lynx heard about this movement, he came to see Stolitz and he brought with him millions and millions of pounds. You know where you're from? All the Muslims, all the non-Muslims of Britain wanted to contribute for this iconic mosque built by the community, denied by the state. People build the mosque as it is. Just Google today. It's called uh, mosque. You just try mosque in Stolitz, and you will have this amazing mosque. Its minaret is still there, intact. And this is the, one of the only places in Islamic lands, you know, that where we have this amazing inclusiveness. You know what? If you look at this uh, minaret, it has a Hindu sign on it. It had a Hebrew sign on it. It had an Islamic sign on it. And it used to have a Christian sign as well. If you see the old pictures, it's one of the most amazing things that we could offer to mankind. Inclusiveness. And if you, do, don't, if you don't know that Hagia Sophia, the mosque, also has in it icons. Gabriel and Michael and Jesus and Mary, they used to offer prayers. We, we used to be a very different kind of people. The only solution for Pakistani problem at the moment, which I see not happening in the near future, is actually communal work. Community should get together from mahala to mahala. Generate resources. I just ask, you know, these people here that if you're an educated person, you can teach at least five to six kids a year. Volunteer. All great nations do volunteer work. States cannot do it because they're crippled. They're selfish. They're egocentric. But if you love your land, which you should, you're born here. I'm born here then you have a responsibility. Talk and do volunteer work. So, um, so you know, thir 32 years ago, this whole, the war was fought. You know, three, four years of total destruction. And obviously, you know, wars are fought by people with big egos who want to, you know, on both sides. And after that, you're talking about a story of a total transformation, rebuilding. So where did these new leaders come from? Like, this is a totally different thinking. Where did they come from? How, did, how come that old thinking disappeared or went into the background? That's one question. Second question is, you talked about the young people armed with knowledge, technology, who could challenge, challenge the old order. You were, uh, you're, you're in the midst of Europe. Uh, the young people had the option of going away, of going to other countries in the EU. Why did they go? Uh, if they didn't, uh, why didn't they go? What kept them there? What's the story there? Because th this is happening today uh, because of the lack of opportunities here, young people are leaving. So what kept the young people there? Thank you very much for your question, sir. As far as the first question, you know, I still think that leadership did not change. They didn't want to change. They were very well off. They were quite, you know, at ease. The game was going on very well. They have an ideology, in our case, Islam, in their case, Serbian Orthodoxism. Actually, Orthodoxism is based on anti-Turkism. They have a claim that Turks massacred them, have mass graves, and now, since they have power, they can now massacre the children of Turks. Now, it is a very naive way of looking at things, but that's what they enjoyed for almost two decades. Islamic war, then war against the Turks. Now, when people realize, finally, that this is leading nowhere. So what happened, I know many Serbian kids. I have published a book 
uh, where I have collected all the poems of Iqbal as you know, addresses to the youth, <coughs> messages to young people. And I have made a team of Serbs, Croats, and Bosnians. These uh, three people then translated the works, you know, guided by me. And we gave the book the title in local language, Iqbal Zaswe, that is Iqbal for all. I wanted to have Iqbal as a meeting point, you know, uh, the message for confidence, khudi, and these kind of things, which was needed there. So I can't say that book played a very important role, but somehow all sensible people would come to this very conclusion that I have to restore myself. I cannot live with an ideology. Our case here in Western India is uh, very specific. Actually, I've never seen any other Muslim community living only by an ideology. There are millions and millions they can stay hungry, but without ideology they cannot. You just have a slogan and you will have you know, 10,000 people on the road, all of them hungry people. How to have this balance now introduced to our community? It is the job done by volunteers only. In Bosnia Herzegovina, I believe that that clerical mind on both sides, Serbs and Muslim both, they were irritating people. When you have same speech day and night, you create an enemy day and night. Sensible people don't buy it anymore. This, this boy is 10 years of age. He went to a mosque just a few months back, and he came back from there and said, how was your experience? And he said, the most difficult 15 minutes of my life because that uh, Imam or Hoja was saying things which were absolutely logical. He's not buying it anymore. Their business depends on it. Their money depends on it. He's not buying. He's not the only one. Nobody's buying. So I believe that this uh, very uh, idea that you create this kind of youngster, a youth which can question, uh, that is there in Bosnia Herzegovina. And the point is connected. Second question, why it happened? Because we are on the you know, uh, doorsteps of Europe. We may disagree with Europe. I do. Everybody does. I mean, nobody's perfect, of course. But Europeans have some system at work. They have some legal thing in their mind functioning that how law can be imposed, how justice can be done, whatever justice is. But there is a concept of justice. They try to you know, introduce it. We have no concept of justice. We have, we have simply erased these ideas from our mind. You know, a, 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 your sweeper sitting down there is injustice. You try to do it in Bosnia Herzegovina. You can't. She will sit next to you, the sweeper. You will offer her a cup of coffee. If you're having breakfast, she will join breakfast at the same table. It's daily routine with us. Europe, even bigger than that. This is injustice. There's somebody as Chota. Oe. Oe. Try to call it somebody Oe there. So when it comes to the value of human being, <coughs> Europe is there to have a model. Islamic world did not offer a model. Where from we get the model? Next doors. And what you were talking about, yes, children do go to Europe. We say around 100,000 people approximately migrate. Migrate is a confusing word. But they do go to Europe. But you know, Europe is not like going from here to Europe or from here to Dubai. Seven hours journey to Vienna, 10 hours journey to uh, Hungary, 18 hours journey to uh, Germany. You can literally come back every week. And that's what many people are doing. They want to go to Europe, have some kind of a job, have some education. And Europe has opened its doors. Today, Bosnia Herzeg, in terms of education, is part of Bologna system. So our kids have exactly the same standard when it comes to the degree as you have in Bologna, in France, in Germany, and Belgium. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate that the pain for the Pakistan or for human beings is very difficult. I don't have any questions, but I want to make a small comment that Pakistan is going through a transitional phase. Now the youth is thinking, questions, 
یا اس طرف اس کی ڈائریکشن بن گئی ہے اور ایسے میں ضروری ہے کہ ہم اپنی مسٹیک سے بھی سیکھیں اور انفارچونیٹلی ہماری زیادہ تر مسٹیکس جو ہیں یا آپ یوں کہہ لیں کہ ہمارے زیادہ تر جو زخم ہیں وہ ہم نے اپنے ہاتھوں سے خود ہی لگائے ہیں اور موسٹ آف آر وونز آر سیلف انفلکٹیڈ تو ایسے میں اپنی خامیوں سے بھی ہمیں سیکھنا چاہیے ایک خود احتسابی کرنی چاہیے اور سرٹنلی آج جو آپ کا لیکچر تھا جو ٹاک تھی اٹ از اے ریمائنڈر کہ ہمیں دوسروں سے بھی سیکھنا چاہیے اور اپنے لیے ایک بہتر راہ کا تعین کرنا چاہیے تاکہ ہمارا مستقبل جو ہے وہ ہمارے حال سے بہتر ہو اتنے زیادہ آب آب آئے ہیں آپ کو سننے اور وی آر ویری تھینک فل ٹو یو اینڈ خاص طور پہ فار یور کائنڈ ورڈس فار دا بلیک ہول وی آر ویری آنر ٹو ہیو یو ہیئر تھینک یو تھینک یو ویری مچ